Our, our next speaker is Dr. Dave Eisenstadt. He is a professor of woody plant physiology at Penn State University. He's been working on tree root systems for over 25 years and has published over 100 peer-reviewed papers on this topic. So this has really been his life's work. His work has involved various fruit crops, such as apple, peach, grape, and citrus, as well as forest trees. And a number of years ago, I believe he spent a sabbatical up in Summerlin, BC uh, with Ag Canada. So he's very familiar with the kind of orchard environment that we have here as well, and is gonna share some of that experience. All right, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of uh, root biology, uh, especially as it pertains to apple, and, uh, and some of the things that uh, help you understand the root system. Um, and I'll tie it to some uh, management uh, type questions. So next slide. Uh, I just want to um, acknowledge the kinds of funding sources, including the Washington Tree Fruit Commission for some of the earlier work that I had done with Denise and Jerry, uh, and uh, some of the graduate students and postdoctoral fellows that had worked in my lab uh, where I'm showing some of this work. And clearly this work can be quite expensive because of the difficulty of looking at roots and, uh, and so I'm very appreciative of, uh, of the various funding agencies. Next slide. So one of the things that I like to, to remind people of is we often are working with very little pieces of information. A lot of times people write reviews with not much data. Papers get published with not much data because it's so expensive to collect. And, uh, and so it can be, uh, we're sometimes only getting a glimpse of the story. Um, this was uh, in uh, Tree Fruit Physiology, uh, an older book that was put out actually by Washington State University Short Course, and uh, which they describe, I think it was Kurt Rahm, described patterns of root growth. And the uh, curve, the solid black line with the asterisks indicates root growth timing in, in the year in relation to above ground, For FB is full bloom and H is harvest. And he was emphasizing the idea of a bimodal distribution where roots were growing in the spring and the fall when it wasn't competing with shoot growth and fruit production. And that's really been a very common notion for many, many years. Another textbook, next slide, looks at uh, a, a very limited uh, investigation uh, of pruned and unpruned apple uh, from East Malling. And this was way back in the 60s, a guy named Head at East Malling in England. And also described this bimodal production where this first idea of, of this competition with above ground. So I'm going to now show you something that's actually showing it's not as clear as people would have liked. This is from the work I had done up in Summerlin with Denise and Jerry Nielsen. Uh, some of the work was on Gala, some was on Golden Delicious. We used, uh, I'm sorry, I'm bouncing without showing you. So uh, the, yeah, the, that, that's a slide. So this is in Summerlin, BC. Next slide. And so we used a, a, a system called mini rhizotrons where we could put a camera down a tube and photograph the roots. And, uh, and in that way, we could observe through time on the very same location how roots uh, uh, grew and their timing of growth. And the next slide. So this is data for the unmulched treatment that was getting fully irrigated. And what I'm showing here is the root distribution taken as a percent of the total. So if you add up every month of the year, the total would be 100%. And so I did this for every plot so that I could talk about relative production over the year. And what we see is in 2002, 
Most of the root production was by the B, the bloom period. And the, the other bar here is harvest. So that you see these vertical bars at the top of the graph, they're, they're bloom, harvest, bloom, harvest over the two years. And the thing that we, we uh, see here is sometimes the root production's at bloom and sometimes the root production is more at harvest, but it's not always both. In fact, in this year, neither, neither year showed a real clear bimodal distribution. So you can see things are not as, as simple as sometimes shown in textbooks. It's also interesting to look at the error bars here that shows the variation in plots. You know, around bloom, the variation could be pretty high in year 2002, but in the, you know, February and March, the variation is very low, indicating in no plot were roots really growing, and so that was probably very constrained by the cold soil temperatures. So, uh, so the variability within the plots is also of, an, of interest. Next slide. We can compare uh, now what I just showed you on the left with no mulching with on the right with mulching. Again, the vertical bars are the, the bloom harvest uh, periods over the two years. And you can see mulching really shifted patterns of production in, uh, in 2002, in the first year. And much more of it was between bloom and harvest, much more production, possibly because the soil was kept moister, but it also seemed to be delaying period of production, maybe because it kept the temperatures a little cooler. And, uh, and so the effect of mulching was to really uh, change some of those cedar seasonal patterns of root production. Next slide. We only had one year of data for the golden delicious that we had worked up. And here, we, again, we did not see root production at harvest time. We only saw it at bloom under the fully irrigated, unmulched golden delicious uh, trees. So seasonal root production, next slide. If we go down each point, so the seasonal root production, first point, root production is unmulched soils. Two of three years began around bloom. Uh, mulching may de delay spring root production, and I also don't say here uh, that it may also increase the amount of production during the summer and, and this is what we often see in the east. We see more root production in that period between uh, bloom and harvest. We get more summer production in the east. And so that's what uh, root production in June and July can vary widely depending on the climate and your, your management system. Root production usually was low during the rapid fruit expansion phase in August. And, and fall root flushes did not always occur. So the idea that there's always a fall root flush and if you can put some fertilizer down there because there's new roots growing, that's, that is not very dependable. We only saw that happen in one year. And then, of course, we don't see many roots being produced uh, during the winter in our climate. So. Um, Broadly, the take-home message is that sometimes things are actually a lot more complicated than we make them out to be. Things are not always accurate in these early textbooks, and, 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 and we're still learning. There's a lot we're still learning. But pattern, seasonal patterns of root production, we don't fully understand what are the factors that control it. Okay, next slide. So this is a close-up of an apple root system. These are what we often call the absorptive roots. They're the ones that we think of as principal for taking up water and nutrients. But there's an organization here that's important. You have very young white roots. You ha if you look at these root tips, these, these ephemeral root tips, I, I don't have a pointer, so it's a little hard for me to point out things, unfortunately. Um, but 
if if you look at the 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 second root uh, from the top, you see a little constriction right where that that new root hits the brown root, and and the other one at the very top, you see a little constriction. These roots are dying like ephemeral units, like leaves. That constriction is where that root will die, and usually it's the whole unit dies. And that's why there's now been a, a recognition that we should think about these roots in terms of orders and modules. And the root w that has no branch is a first order root, and then the root that it's coming off of would be a second order and third order, just like people often describe streams as first and second order streams. You could do the same in roots. And it seems to be that it's easier to understand roots by using an order approach than a diameter approach, because you can see these roots have very similar diameter between the second and first order, but they're really quite different physiologically. The, the second order root is much more used for transport, the first order more for absorption. And if we showed the second order attached to the third order root even more so, the third order will be used for transport and so on. So you can have some big changes in roots and still think of them as fine roots. So I'm going to show you now some reasons why that ordering is important. I already made mention of the, the fact that lifespan may differ. This is work that uh, a student of mine, Christina Wells, did in Apple. Sorry, I didn't mention the slide. Um, and, uh, where she showed that very small diameter differences in the roots, we're talking about roots that are 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters in the, in the 94 slide and 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters. Those roots, when looking at them over the winter, November through March, they almost all died. None of them that were there in November were still around in March. But roots only slightly smaller, slightly larger, excuse me, in diameter, 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters, showed much less mortality. About 34% were still alive. And roots greater than 0.5 millimeters, more than 50% were still alive. But think about it. Many times when you're looking at roots, if it's less than half a million millimeter in diameter, you think of them as fine roots. They're, they're just fine and you don't make any other distinctions. But these small differences in diameter can have large implications on what that role of the root is. The, the, the roots that are half millimeter and larger, those are more semi-permanent members of the root system, whereas these very young roots are the very absorptive, fragile roots that are turning over quite rapidly. And 95 showed a little more separation, but basically the same story. So, so we can think of these roots these fine root systems as having a degree of organization that, that uh, is helpful to understand. Next slide. And, and this shows it a little more clearly in peach. This is not apple here, but Christina showed it in peach, how order one roots, which are the black lines, showed uh, uh, increased mortality so that after about 100 days, 50% of the roots were, were dead in order one on the top graph, but 50% mortality, which would be median lifespan, was over 200 days in orders two and three. So for half the population to die, which would be 50%, that's what this survival probability does, that would be the median lifespan. And you see it's almost a double a lifespan for the, the order two and three compared to order one showing the big differences. The differences were a little smaller in the, the following year. But, but it does show the importance of, of root order in understanding root longevity. Now, I don't have work uh, that really has dissected the root system for characteristics. We're, we're actually doing that right now. This is of apple. But we have done it in blueberry. And if any of you have grown blueberry, you probably realize they have a very fine root system. And they actually are quite hard to work with from a root perspective. But we wanted to see if this very fine root system was different from some things that have been looked at in forest trees. And so this is kind of a schematic. Next slide. This is a schematic of, of a 
blueberry root system, showing how it's organized in an order concept, where the first order is the finest lateral, the most distal, second order, third order. And it's a very dissected branch root system. And the diameter of a first order root in blueberry is only about 40 mic microns. It's really small. That's about 0.04 millimeters, much smaller than apple. But we can look at what is the influence of order on the function of the root system in these fine roots of blueberry. Next slide. So this shows that the, the, the pattern of diameter of roots in blueberry for different orders. The first order being, like I said, about 0.04 millimeters. If you look at where apple is around, like Christina showed, 0.1 to 0.3 millimeters, you see that those roots of apple would be fourth to seventh order roots of blueberry. They're completely different systems. They're completely different root systems. Blueberry is much finer than apple, but it, it shows how order and diameter are loosely correlated, where first and second order don't change that much, but then with each higher order, they tend to be thicker, and that's partly because we're getting in the woody root system. So that's how you can use branching order and how it's related to diameter. Next slide. And here I'm just reminding people of, of how fruit crops differ. The average diameter of, of, of apple roots that we've looked at in a number of root stacks is about three-tenths of a millimeter. And, you, and so it's still finer than things like grape and certainly citrus, but it's, it's not anything like blueberry. So here we, we actually took sections of blueberry roots and we looked at them. And since I can't point out features very easily, I just want to show you in the first and second order at the top, they're small diameter and they have very few cell layers. They have an epidermis, which is the outer cell layer, and uh, the CO stands for coils. That's what the kind of mycorrhiza in, in, in these type of roots have, have coiled mycorrhiza. And then uh, the, uh, um, the, stellar, the vascular tissue is in the central part, that's the steel. Uh, and, and, uh, and the EN stands for endodermis. If you go to the third order roots, you see they're still pretty much an absorptive root. There hasn't been that much change, a little more robust epidermal cell. The fourth root now, we're now seeing what we call secondary development, secondary xylem. The SX stands for secondary xylem. This is now a woody root. This has now woody vascular tissue and the fifth and sixth are also woody vascular tissue. So you can have a root that's only about a, a, a tenth or 1.15 millimeters in diameter, and it can be woody. It can be a, a woody root, and that's what's happening in blueberry. So in blueberry, it's pretty clear that the first three orders are primarily absorptive, and after that, they're primarily woody. And even though blueberry has very, very fine roots. This same pattern has been found in many, many woody species. The first two, sometimes three orders are absorptive. The higher order roots are woody. They're being used mainly for transport. They're not used for absorption. It's the very lowest order roots that are being used for absorption. Next slide. And this is actually borne out when you also look at mycorrhizal colonization of these roots. The high mycorrhizal, highest mycorrhizal colonization of the blueberry roots are in those first two orders of roots. That's where the highest colonization. And then it starts dropping off in the third. And we saw some fourth order roots that weren't woody. But as soon as the root becomes truly all woody, then there can't be mycorrhiza because myco mycorrhiza need those living cortical cells. So the mycorrhizae are going to be in those finest root orders. They're not going to be in those higher root orders. Even if they look pretty fine by the naked eye, they're not going to be really used in absorption and being used to support mycorrhizae. Next slide. 
I showed this slide just partly because the PhD student work on this, this was an incredible amount of work. Here they dissected all the different root orders in blueberry. It had to be done under a microscope. This is a microscope slide. And what I'm showing in that red box is his hair. That is the, uh, uh, a piece of, uh, uh, I clipped up a hair from his head to give a bearing of just how small these things are. So that's, that's what we're looking at here to give you a frame of reference. So these are very fine roots. And he needed to collect dyes like this to look at this next piece of information. This is an estimate of the nitrogen concentration of the roots. We're basically looking at the nitrogen carbon ratio. But carbon doesn't change. Its concentration doesn't change in a root. So using the nitrogen carbon ratio can be a good measure of the nitrogen concentration. And you can see how important those first order roots are in, for, in terms of how much nitrogen they have. And that's what's indicating all the enzymes needed to carry nutrients into the plant. Those are carrier enzymes and, and metabolic enzymes, and that's what's reflecting in this high nitrogen concentration of the first order root. As you get to a second order root, the, the roots are older, they're less active, and its nitrogen concentration is dropping. So, the plant is putting its nitrogen into the roots that are most absorptive. And as the roots get into higher order, there's much less nitrogen in the roots. But the, the underscoring point here is how order organizes the function of the root system. And finally, as I showed before, this is survivorship of blueberry roots, small differences between first and third order roots. But what really is being reflected here is these roots die as a module. When a first and second order root dies, the third order root typically dies too, or soon after that. They're, they're not, they, they die more like, think of it like a compound leaf. Like if you know, know a leaf that's compound like, like a elderberry. You know, the little leaflets may die, but eventually the whole leaf dies. And, it's, and that's the whole unit. And so a root module with, with three orders will die as a unit if that's the ephemeral part of the root system. And what remains is that higher order root, that fourth order root, and that's the one that persists through the winter and then will regrow new roots each spring and, and, and summer. So it's, it's, that is the system, and, and what people don't often think about, though, is that fourth order root, as in blueberry, may be really quite fine, but that's the more permanent part of the root system. Next slide. So here I'm going to just summarize some things about blueberries, but, but the, although the diameter shifts, the concepts regarding order are the same. The first three order uh, diameters were very small. There were only 40 to 75 microns. This is, and those first three orders have the highest mycorrhizal colonization and the highest nitrogen concentration. And we believe that, that probably the same occurs in apple. They have similar lifespans, and so they die as a module. And so that's the absorptive part of a root system. Now I'm going to jump here, go ahead now, and talk about something that uh, is also important to recognize when you're looking at roots. And, and simply put, not all roots are born the same. Some are born with different developmental uh, roles than others. And we often refer to the two types of major root types as pioneer and fibrous. And the fibrous are the roots that I was just talking about. Those are the primary absorptive roots that are fine and, and branch out. But those long white roots that are unbranched, and I, I'm, I'm showing an example as populus tremuloides, but you can see it in apple too. Those roots are what we call the pioneer roots. Now pioneer roots have a very different role. Next slide. So in studying this, we, this is not going to be work from apple. This was uh, from a common garden in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is not a bad looking state, by the way. But uh, what I'm showing is a common garden of different forest trees that I also studied. And these have very different uh, fine root systems, and that was partly why I chose to plant it. 
And uh, below are some of the people that helped in this work, Taryn Bowerly, who's now a professor at Cornell, and Tom Adams, who uh, provides technical support for the lab. Next slide. So I'm comparing now these pioneer and fibrous roots. I don't know how much of that one slide I was talking about in the pioneer fibrous got cut off. Did, did my, my vocal get cut off too when we lost uh, Link? Yes. Okay, so, so I was describing their differences between pioneer and fibrous. I'm not sure exactly when, but they have very different roles. First thing, as you can see, is what we have here is five different tree species and they have very different small root diameters. Populus tremuloides, if you look at its root diameter of the fibrous root, it's 0.3 millimeters. On the far right is Luriodendron tulip fera, which is tulip poplar. Its diameter was about 0.9 millimeters. So really quite different. The tulip poplar is very coarse, the tulip fera. Now you look at the pioneer roots. They're always a lot larger than the fibrous root typically one to two millimeters in diameter in every species. And we also looked at specific root length, which is the length to mass ratio. And coarse roots have a smaller specific root length than fine roots, that just makes sense because you're not getting as much length for the same volume. So a coarse root doesn't get that much length, but it has a smaller specific root length. And so, but we can also think about specific root length in terms of how much energy the plant is using to produce length, because length is the way main, main way plants can absorb nutrients. If plants are producing a thin root with high specific root length, it can produce a lot of length for a certain carbon investment. But if it's coarse, it's gonna have a lot less length for a given carbon investment, and that's gonna give it less absorptive surface area. So for whatever reason, the plant is producing some of these roots that, where they get very little length for the amount of carbon investment. Now, if we, next slide. If we look at the anatomy of these roots, next slide. I don't know in this light room if you can see this. This may not be showing up. But simply put, there's a barrier just inside the epidermis called the hypodermis, and that will, under UV light, will, will show up, will autofluoresce. And in fibrous roots, it has a single layer of hypodermis, and that has to do with the suprin. Earlier in talks, they were talking about the casparine strip and the endodermis, that's the inner roots. We're only talking about very young roots here, only 14 days old. They have a fairly well-formed endodermis, but also a fairly well-formed hypodermis, that outer layer. And, and they were talking about how nutrients move in and out, and, and nutrients have problems getting past the hypodermis, so they have to go into special kinds of cells called passage cells, and those are the cells that don't show the autofluorescence. The big difference is on the right, where there's pioneer roots, there's several layers of hypodermis. So it's kind of like several walls of protection. It's protecting the root from pathogens and, and, and stresses like salinity and things, but it also prevents it from being very absorptive. And so this, now next slide, is basically the average of these five different tree species. And the dark bar, the black bar, is the pioneer roots, and the open bar is the fibrous roots. And if we start with the hypodermal layers, like I just described, Usually, fibrous roots only have a single hypodermal layer, just about one, whereas pioneer roots often have about four hypodermal layers. It's really well protected. Passive cell frequency. Now, those are the cells in the hypodermis that allow nutrients to come in where mycorrhizal hyphae will come in. Those are really important for absorption. In pioneer roots, the black bar, you can see that there was a, a low percentage of uh, passage cells, less than 5% in the pioneer roots. But in the fibrous roots, the open bar, we had over 20% of that layer represented by, by passage cells for roots that were less than 14 days old. Mycorrhizal colonization was uh, roughly around 15% in 14-day-old roots, and 
there was no mycorrhizal colonization in pioneer roots. Mycorrhizae were unable to colonize the pioneer root. But similarly, non-mycorrhizal colonization, these are fungi that were not mycorrhizal fungi and could have been pathogens, so we didn't know for sure, those also were much lower in the pioneer roots. So it's kind of like the pioneer root is the tank and the, the, the uh, fibrous root is the little automobile. And what's going on is that pioneer root is used to build the framework of the root system. Now, some of you have been, been wondering, possibly, if you thought about this order thing, that if first and second order roots are always dying, how do you get a higher order root? It doesn't make sense. That, that you would get a higher order root if these first and second order roots are always dying. Well, the, re the way you get higher order roots is by the pioneer roots, because they don't die. They are the ones that build the framework of the root system. And they build the root system, and they become woody quickly. Within a couple weeks, they start becoming woody. And then they start branching. And the roots that branch off them may be pioneer roots to make more of a framework of a tree, or they may be the, the fine fibrous roots that are used for nu nutrient absorption. And it's those roots that will then turn over and have a short lifespan. So I wanted to emphasize this to help you see that those roots, those pioneer roots are really important for developing your framework. They're not important for absorption, but, you, but you, if you see pioneer roots dying, you really have a pathogen problem because that means you those, your, your framework is not getting built. And those roots are normally very protected. So there, there, there's, there's bigger problems when those, those roots die. Next slide. So this again is a picture of a, of a, of a root. This is grape roots here. And, uh, and again, uh, we're looking at things, but there's also this white fuzz in the picture, and that's the mycorrhizal hyphae that can emanate from the root and help with nutrient absorption. And, and I'll talk a little bit about microbes here. This was done uh, uh, with uh, uh, Apple Orchard in Pennsylvania, and this was one of the students working on it, and we were working in these root boxes. Next slide. And, uh, and so these are uh, absorptive roots with arbuscules, arbuscules of, uh, in apple. The arbuscules are the part of the mycorrhizal fungi that's important for nutrient exchange, and that's what it looks like. These are very healthy roots. But sometimes, next slide, there's roots that uh, are non-mycorrhizal. And AM fungi don't have hyphae with septa, those little lines, those, those yellow arrows are pointing at septate, and, uh, and, and those uh, show, I mean, it's a higher uh, type of fungi, and uh, they're not going to be AM fungi, and that's how we can recognize non-AM fungi in the root. And so you get these non-AM fungi, and, and you can have some that are somewhat pathogenic, uh, as well as some that may be more neutral. So here was one of the most interesting things we found from this study. Next slide. Yeah, you got it. Uh, in, when we looked at the fungi, the roots and what fungi they had, we found roughly in the fall about 28% had mycorrhizal fungi, where in the spring of 1998, 42% had mycorrhizal fungi. We found in other roots about 50% had not mycorrhizal fungi in the fall, a higher percentage than what we found in the spring. On the spring, only 11%. And there were also some that had no infection at all. But what was really interesting was, in these young roots that were less than 15 days old, there were no roots that had both kinds of fungi. Now that could mean a couple different things, but what we, anticipated meaning is that the mycorrhizal fungi are making it the root unacceptable to the, the non-mycorrhizal fungi. There's actually competition going on. And, and uh, while we don't have ironclad proof of this, this is what the data was suggesting to us. 
And let me show you a little more why we think this. Next slide. This graph is a little bit complicated. The red curve is mycorrhiza, the blue curve is uninfected, and the yellow curve is non-mycorrhiza, roots that were non-mycorrhiza. Now, we were following individual roots every day. So when we harvested the roots at 15 days, we knew from each section how old they were. So, so we, we, we made a harvest, and some of the roots that had just started growing three days earlier would only be three days old. And, and roots that had just grown one day earlier, started growing one day earlier, were only one day old. These are new roots that are emerging on the root box. So we have now information as a function of age of, of what was colonized them, as indicated by the red, yellow, and blue, but we also know how fast they were growing on those various days by the tracing that we were doing of the roots. And what we see that really caught our eye was the roots that were mycorrhizal were growing faster than the roots that were non-mycorrhizal or uninfected. And yet, it was not till day six that we ever saw the mycorrhiza ever actually enter the root. It took six days for the mycorrhiza to enter the root. But uh, the roots had to be six days old before uh, the mycorrhiza entered the root, and yet they had been growing faster from the day they first came out of that second order root, the, the, the day of first emergence. So that's suggesting that mycorrhiza are going after the faster growing roots that might have had more sugars and more resources going in, and then, and that happened at day six. Now, the time that we saw the non mycorrhizal fungi coming was somewhat delayed. It was not till day nine. And they were mainly colonizing those slow growing roots that were really not, not growing much at all. And so there seems to be this, this separation going on in these fine roots between which roots get the beneficial fungi and which roots may get the, the non beneficial fungi. And these kinds of, of dynamics that, that are occurring at this fine scale um, help us to understand what might shift the balance between, uh, you know, the root doing well and the root not doing well. So I'm going to add a little more to this with this uh, study that we recently did. And this is a graduate student and a visiting scientist worked on this study, Emily Lavely and uh, Ji Hong, Zhang, and this is also in our apple orchards uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, basically where we looked at cropping and no cropping and how it affected this pattern of infection. And we had root boxes between four trees that were either kept in a no crop or, or a cropped uh, condition and looked at patterns of, of root growth and colonization of fungi. And so the experimental unit uh, where we made the measurements were those two trees. Go ahead and, and advance, yeah. So the next slide. So now we, we added localized nitrogen to see how they would forage in nutrient-rich patches. And so in each window, they got a different nutrient patch. Go ahead, advance and advance again. And, uh, and so we had uh, nitrogen treatments, which we applied to three of the four windows. And I'll talk about those in just a second. And they were applied right at the root emergence around uh, end of May, beginning of June. So we had, next slide. We had a control where we had no fertilizer. We had uh, urea fertilizer, which was typical for these orchards type of fertilizer. And then we took what would be naturally occurring nitrogen is we took leaves from the apple and just used them as an organic nitrogen control. And we tried to match the two nitrogens and we actually were quite successful. This is the nitrogen solution and you can see uh, that the urea and organic were very similar. In the no crop they were presumably depleting the nitrogen because of the leaf growth. And so it was a little bit lower for both, but they again were very, very similar, the urea and organic. 
the control where he had no net nitrogen, as expected, was a little bit lower. Next slide. So we, we drew roots and we used different color pens to indicate roots of, uh, that grew at different ages, and then we measured their length. And so this is how we, we've been doing these root box studies. Next slide. So the first thing is what you might expect, that cropping reduced the amount of root growth. This is generally well understood uh, that if there's less carbohydrates available for the roots, then there, you'll get less root growth and more of the carbohydrates going into the crop. Next, advance this. Next slide. But now let's look at how the roots foraged in patches. So on the left is the cropping treatment, where the roots were cropped, uh, uh, where the trees were, had, had a full crop. And we can see that uh, what you often see is roots were proliferating most in, in the mineral nutrient nitrogen treatment, intermediate in the organic, and lowest in the control. And that's what you'd expect. You'd want the roots to forage in the, the regions with the most available nutrients. We were surprised that the organic and aria were, were, were not more similar, but nonetheless, they both showed that preferential uh, growth. Now, the, the next graph I want to put up is the uncropped. So th there it is, and you can see that they're very similar, the, the two urea treatments. So what's going to happen with those other two treatments? If you advance it, you see that what we're seeing here is when there's lots of carbohydrate, the root system is being much less selective on where they forage for nutrients. They're foraging in the unfertile soil at the same levels they're foraging in the fertile soil. And this has partly been looked at in other systems, and we think this is related to priming. Because if there's lots of extra carbon, you can actually increase nutrient availability by pushing carbon into the rhizosphere, and the microbes use that and help mineralize more nitrogen that the plant can take up. And so while it, it's more expensive to forage in the low nutrient soil, if you've got lots of carbon to use, then that's what the trees are doing. So that preferential growth was, was really a measure of being able to, to forage more efficiently with, when there's limited carbon supply, and on the right, when there's not limited carbon supply, it's not in, in the tree's advantage to try to forage that efficiently. They're going to get nutrients any way they can. Next slide. Our advance. Yeah. So what about mycorrhizal colonization? There was evidence that the roots that had a crop actually had a little bit higher mycorrhizal colonization, a little less root growth, but more mycorrhiza. Next slide. And, and uh, in terms of uh, the patches, this was done with PLFA as a measure of biomass. We saw evidence that, that there was actually more extramatrical hyphae in the organic nutrient patch, and cropping did not affect this. The left was the crop, the, the right was the uncropped. Now, this is one of the, 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 the things that we thought might happen, and it indeed, we, we found that. There were more roots that were colonized by non-mycorrhizal fungi under cropping. So not only do, is there plenty of carbon for root growth with no crop, it suggests there's also plenty of carbon for defense, so that they can better keep out these non-mycorrhizal fungi than the crop trees. And so there is higher incidence of, of colonization by these, these non-mycorrhizal fungi in the crop trees. And we did some uh, preliminary molecular analysis, and we did find uh, one of the, the organisms associated with root plant disease in these, uh, in these roots. So now I'm at the summary here. And uh, let's advance. So first, I wanted to talk about the seasonality. And we see that root growth varies annually, but usually is occurring right around bloom 
in, in at least in your system, we see a little more in the summer in our in, in our climate. If I made you realize anything, it's that not all fine roots less than one millimeter are functionally the same. Variation is more described by root order and their position in that root system. Advance again. As was said in some of the earlier talks, you really can't understand the root system without understanding the whole tree condition. As we talked about, some of it was related to mulching, some of it was related to cropping, but in, in, in any of these conditions, they can affect how the roots are gonna respond. And in particular, if carbohydrates are less available to the roots, this can affect the efficiency of foraging and root defense of pathogens. Continued. Uh, as I said, not all roots are born the same. You have the pioneer roots that build the framework, as well as the fibrous roots that are for absorption. And finally, uh, if we're going to try to identify key functional differences in the root system, uh, we, we have to, uh, um, you know, um, have uh, recognized that, that that we're not going to understand the function as it relates to management practices without that better understanding. I think that we need to move more into uptake, some of the important functions, and I think there's new ways that we can look at this that, that may give us a better understanding under field conditions of, uh, of uptake, and some of this can be done through gene activation and, and other approaches using molecular tools. We're, there's a big push because of uh, understanding carbon footprint under different practices to better understand the carbon cycle in agricultural systems. And I think there's a lot of research effort going into this. Uh, and so I think that will be better understood. Uh, the root interaction with soil micro microbes, that's one of the areas that we're pushing hard in our lab now. I think there's with the molecular tools and understanding things at the individual root level, we can make some really important advances here. And finally, I think one of our goals, and I think it, it's a very important goal, is when we have crop models, not to treat the roots as a black box, but start to really put some mechanistic information in there so that there is an informed root module in these whole plant crop models. Thank you. Um, first question is, does pruning a root stimulate a given type of root or mycorrhizal development? The question was pruning a root? Pruning, yes, pruning. Yeah, pruning root is going to initially create a lot of pioneer roots. Those are usually the first roots that are going to come off. When you cut a woody root, the, the plant immediate response is to rebuild the framework of the root system. And so it's going to try to rebuild the, that with pioneer roots. So that's usually uh, um, the, the first response. Uh, and pioneer roots don't have mycorrhiza. Of course, one, after some months, you know, fibrous roots might come off the pioneer roots. But in the, in the first month or so, that's what the main thing the plan is uh, working on, is rebuilding the framework. Okay, the next question was, um, why don't mycorrhizae infect pioneer roots? Now, there, there's a the pioneer root is being built to be very defended and to serve as transport. The, the period that they're actually going to be absorbed to this short, usually only a few weeks, they're, they're already moving into a woody state. The mycorrhizae need passage cells to come into the root, and there's fume passage cells in a pioneer root. But there's also little gain for the mycorrhiza because when those cortical cells die as the root becomes woody, then the mycorrhiza are pushed out, they're killed. They got, they, the mycorrhizal fungi can't live in, in, in a woody root. There's no cortex for them to live in. So there, there's, no, there's no real advantage for them to colonize a, a pioneer root either. Okay, we have another question about nitrogen fertilization. Um, should nitrogen fertilizer be applied at or just before bloom to give peak growth in uh, the two months after bloom? Uh, 
you know, I, I'd hate to be that. I would argue, especially in some of these sandy soils, to, to use a slow-release fertilizer because we don't have definitively knowledge that roots are going to be grown at bloom, you know, or any time. It's not that dependable. So the longer the nutrient can hang around, the better you can hedge your bets. So, but beyond that, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I think adding nitrogen, you know, at bloom is, is not an unreasonable time because it takes, you know, the roots are just growing out at that time. So they haven't built up that big a population. But then I would, you know, push to have that nitrogen in there for a while so that if there are some later flushes in the summer, for whatever reason, you know, there's still some nutrients there for them. But this is really speculative. You know, the kinds of studies that we're looking for here is to couple good root growth with, you know, things like N15 fertilizers to really look at the linkage between root growth and nutrient uptake. And, and, and because otherwise we're, we're kind of guessing. Okay, we got one other, one other text here. It says, uh, how much increase of mycorrhizae do you get when you inoculate roots with a mycorrhizal product before planting? Well, you know, I don't know. If you've got good, good soils, Normally they say there's very little advantage, at least from my understanding, of trying to inoculate. There should be plenty of native fungi there. Remember, it, it it's partly has to do with, uh, you know, there may be other things that uh, may be involved that help, might help protect it from from uh, pests if, they, if they're colonized a little bit earlier. But I, I'm afraid I, I, I'm not, ready to answer that question. It, I, it's just too, too uncertain in my mind what the pros and cons are. It's a difficult area to study. Okay, I think we'll take some from the audience. Anyone have a question here? I know that in GRAPE, rootstock research by David Smart and Andy Walker, that there are differences in the timing of root growth um, under a, a different rootstocks with, different, with the same scion in response to environmental demands. You did not mention what rootstocks you were look, studying in examining root growth patterns. Are okay. there differences among roots, apple or other yeah. so rootstocks? I do not know the rootstock effects in apple. I was actually with David Smart on some of those studies. But uh, the, the the rootstock we were using in, in Summerlin was M9. Um, so, so there certainly can be rootstock effects. You know, I would expect that too. Um, so, yeah, it just adds a little more to the, that uncertainty. Do we have time for more? Any other questions? I had one more text that just okay. came in. Laura, Laura has a question also. Okay. All right. Um, what about mycorrhizal addition to the roots for trees being planted post fumigation? Yeah, I think that's important. You know, if you've knocked out the mycorrhizal inoculum through fumigation, then then you know having having them pre inoculated would would be of value. If they're if if they're you know if they're you know, coming out of the nursery without good inoculation. But if, if you really knock back the mycorrhizal fungi uh, in, in, your, your, in the planting prep, then, then that might be needed. Okay, we have one more from the audience here. Have a uh, replant uh, tradition in some, some regions of using a high phosphorus fertilizer at time of replant. What is that effect on mycorrhizae? Is it better understood now? So, so you were asking about replant in mycorrhiza, and yeah, yeah they, they've uh, people used to to think that adding a high phosphorus fertilizer at the time of planting would help to ameliorate replant disease, and, and the question is. Any sense of how that might interact with the mycorrhiza? 
situation because obviously they do respond to yeah. phosphorus uh, inversely? Right. So, so you know, there's a good possibility it has a negative interaction with the mycorrhiza. My, if the plant is high in phosphorus, it tends to, I could see why it could help with the replant disease too. It, it makes the roots less, less easy to colonize by all kinds of organisms, including mycorrhiza. So, so, um, so the plants that are high in phosphorus do tend to have lower mycorrhizal colonization, but it may still be beneficial in keeping out some of the pathogens too. We we'll have one more text that just okay. Came. And I, I've got a question. I'm going to ask real quick. Well, okay. b before the text, you well, go I've ahead. Got a chance. Okay. Uh, a number of our growers use tillage for weed control in the tree row, and there's been the perennial question of: Is that root pruning significant? Does it shave off the roots in the surface, but they they reestablish below, so you don't really lose the total amount of root system over time? Or I've seen evidence in the literature kind of both ways. I just wonder what your sense of that is. Yeah, I think at the tree, the trees are, are not, you know, I think there's a lot of vigor in the trees, then, then probably you can get away with that. But if the trees are, are, are not all that vigorous, it, it, it may be more detrimental. So it's kind of, you know, you've got to be careful. But you're obviously causing the plant, and that's the goal, is to put a lot more energy below ground to, instead of into above ground vegetative growth, right? That's usually the goal in, in some of that, uh, as well as, you know, with, well, I was thinking about root pruning, but, but tillage would, would have some of those same, same factors. It, it, it's going to cause energy going into building roots, but, but uh, you, you at the same time are reducing competition. So there's a balance there, and, uh, and, and, and you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, if a person is going to, where they're going to stand on that balance. But clearly, if you're cutting roots, especially if you're cutting some of the woody roots, it takes a fair amount of energy for the plant to rebuild it. Okay. Thank you very much, Dave. We're going to get set up for the next speaker.